Welcome to the Spin Whiz Comic Show. Whoa. From Raleigh, North Carolina. Join us for exclusive interviews with the publishers, bringing you the newest titles in indie comics, web comics, movies, and more. No way. Way. And now, here's your host, Jeff Palumbo. This is the place for you. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for stopping in to say hello. Uh, great show for you tonight. We have creator and author of Nomad, who is a, uh, well, he's technically not a partner of ours. His company is Vulture Comics. Uh, Nomad number one is up on Spinwiz right now. Nomad number two is on Kickstarter. Bill Stoddard is actually here. Um, I can't wait to talk to him. Nomad is probably one of the prettiest comics that I have seen on Spinwiz Comics um, in quite some time. Everybody's kind of got their different flow, but this one is one that you definitely want to read. Uh, and I'll t- go into it more. Again, if you are actually listening on our podcast, don't worry about it. All the links will be in transcription. And if you are uh, watching on YouTube, all the links are below. So don't even sweat about not being here live. If you're here live from twitch.tv backslash spin was fantastic. Ask your questions. Hang out. Be a part of the community. Otherwise, leave your comments below. Bill will see them. The bad ones we're going to ignore, and we're just going to roll them off, and I'll probably delete them. Anyway. Without further ado, let me bring the man in. Here he is. Bill, are you there? Look at that. I'm there. Look How at that you, smiley Jeff? face and everything. Um, Bill, thank you for coming in. Thank you for some spending some time with us tonight. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. It's a true pleasure. Uh, we met probably about, what, about maybe maybe a year ago? Give or take, when you were when you were kind of pushing yeah. Nomad number one. No, you were. It was even it was before Nomad. Six months ago. Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess I. It, I guess it is about a year. Well, ago. we were in contact. We didn't. You didn't yeah. become a partner till about six months ago. Right. Um, right. But I think you were. You had a couple titles you were working on. Nomad had just come out into Kickstarter, I think. Um, yes. And I I pushed that because it was fantastic. Um, Let's talk a little bit before we get into Nomad, because I, I know everybody wants to hear about it, and I want to talk about the Kickstarter. Let's talk about you and how you got into it, because as I talked to, you know, you know, we had Tony on earlier earlier in the week, and you know, we've had Jose and all these guys, and everybody's either a writer or an artist or whatever, but we all have full time jobs. Um, right. How did you find the time, which? working a full-time job and then doing this like most of us how do you find time to write like a madman um basically just any free time that i'm not uh goofing off playing video games or (laughs) something like that um i get i work pretty early in the morning um i usually get up for work around five Uh, but that gives me the advantage of being home you know mid-afternoon before a lot of other people are um so i get home before my wife gets home i can write then and then when my wife gets home i spend a lot of time with her and but she's really supportive of my writing um so whenever i need some free time to write she's super understanding of it um so I make it work. I don't always write a ton every day. Sometimes it's only, you know, a couple sentences. Maybe I struggle with half a page of a script for an entire night. But, you know, just try to get in as much as you can. Yeah, well, that happens. I mean, even when I'm writing, um, I will get like a a massive like lightning bolt to the brain. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. And I'll rip right. through like <laughs> eight or nine pages and then I will look at the tenth page and just be like, "What did I write?" Or yep, I'll try to exactly. I'll say, "I want to write tonight," and I'll come home and I'll look at my computer and I'll be like, "Not tonight." Um, yep. <laughs> and it just I, I think you know I talked to uh, to Frank uh, Gogol that's over in Source Point Press and he says the yep. same thing and and he's a professional like that's what he does he's a writer right um, yeah and he's like no sometimes you just get that massive block. And, uh, but we have other things, you know, you have stuff going on during the day and you got stresses and stuff like that. But, um, I think the thing that brings me back much like golf, it's the one shot 
that I really do well out of the really crappy 97 <laughs> other strokes that brings me yep. right back to want to play. And I think I, I write the same way. Do you feel that same thing where you're just like, oh, my gosh, I got so much done. It was awesome, and you're super proud of it? Yeah, that's actually a really good analogy <laughs> um, <laughs> because I can go days, weeks. I've gone a couple months before where I'm just – struggling every single night um just agonizing over one section of a story that you know i just can't quite get it right for whatever reason mm -hmm. um and my wife is my major proofreader and she'll tell me if something sucks <laughs> um and even if she says it's good i'm just like no it's not good something's wrong but then like you said just kind of a lightning bolt hits you and you just go off, you mm -hmm. know, and sometimes it's, you look back and it's amazing. And sometimes you wake up the next day and look at it and say, why did I think this was amazing? This is horrible. Yeah. Yeah. Scrap it again. Thank uh, you so much. Yeah. And you know, going back to the wives, aren't they awesome at telling us exactly what we need to know, regardless of what kind of feelings are in the way? Yes. Yes, they are. <laughs> yeah. I love my she's, wife to death. And... She's very delicate with my feelings, but she'll definitely tell me what I need to hear, even mm -hmm. if I don't really want to hear it. <laughs> that's exactly the way my wife is. And she's like, I just don't want you to fail. And I think that's fantastic. Having that support of somebody who's not going to blow smoke up your ass. Um, exactly. Because when we do this, you and I specifically, and a lot of the smaller guys, we have one shot every three months to really make, or even longer to make an impact with our comic right and if it sucks it's really hard to come back from that it's really hard to get somebody to read number one they think it sucks and then all of a sudden number two is a is brilliant like it's, yep. that's an uphill push that is really really tough so um what is your release schedule usually like like how, how long do you write and then what's your production schedule based off of that um right now i believe we sent out all the rewards for the Nomad number one. I think it was in August, mid-August. Mm -hmm. um, and so now we're launching. Obviously, we already launched the number two Kickstarter in October. Um, we try to give ourselves from the time of the launch um, to the send out of the rewards. We try to give ourselves three to four months. Um we hope it's closer to two to three months, um, but my artist, Stan Yak, he's super talented. Um, he gets a lot of commissions, and he's working on other books for guys like Bob Sally at Source Point Press mm -hmm. um, and Robert Nugent, my colorist, and he's also the co-founder of Vulture Comics with me. Um he pretty much pairs with Stan on all of his projects and he's got a ton of other commissions. So, um, and the reality is as much as we all love working on nomad, um, they do art for a living. Mm -hmm. Um, so they might get the chunk of cash from the Kickstarter, but that'll cover the bills for a few weeks, but that doesn't continue to cover the bills. Yep. So, um, we try to, balance it out between giving them time to produce a good comic and not keeping the customers waiting. Um, because I've experienced, um, sometimes years in between pledging to a Kickstarter for a comic and not getting the book. Oh my gosh. Really? Yeah. Um, it's rare and it doesn't happen with the guys that are really serious about it. Um, to me, it's only happened once, but I've heard some horror stories. I have um, too. Yeah, I've heard some really bad ones. And so that's what we don't want. We want the customer to be satisfied, mm -hmm. you know. And luckily, most people that support indie comics on Kickstarter are um, very understanding and realize that it takes some time. Um, so we haven't run into any issues with that yet, but... Sorry, I know that was a long-winded answer. No, but... <laughs> that, was, that was the perfect answer. That's exactly what we're here for. You know, one of the things that uh, originally when you and I had spoken, um, my Kickstarter had failed miserably. Yeah. And now, granted, that was six years ago now because I'm getting old, and, you know, Chimera, <laughs> it, Chimera is primed 
for an issue number two. It's already written. I just need to find artists to do it. But, right. um, you know, the the way things have changed is indie guys now can make at least a partial living off of Kickstarter if you're cranking through them. Um, right. But I think what a lot of people don't understand is that if you don't have a built-in team that helps you save some money here and there um, or an artist that works on um, just because they love it and they're part of that team and they're like, oh, we'll, I'll get paid on the Kickstarter, we're good, that you have to do something like me and basically pay five or six grand up front for a really good comic. And right. that's tough. I mean, m maybe in your life, five or six grand cash is easy, but most people no. I know, <laughs> no. not an easy thing. So I, I'm i personally stuck. Like, Spinwiz has to do really well in order for me to get issue number two out the door, or even half of it to do a Kickstarter. But um, do you find that sometimes that Kickstarter, even though you're, you're writing, you're working a full-time job, that Kickstarter in its own right is very draining because i did i was exhausted yeah um i'm very grateful that kickstarter exists um and for the most part i enjoy doing the kickstarter it's the setup and the promotion that's exhausting for mm -hmm. me yep that's um, what i meant yeah i love interacting with the fans um because i mean who doesn't like being told that you're awesome. Mm -hmm. I agree. <laughs> so, yeah. That part. And, you know, for smaller guys like us, um, like you said earlier, it's tough to get an audience. It's tough to even get anybody to want to read your book. Um, if, especially if you're not connected to any sort of well known publisher. Um, because most comics fans, I mean, it's changing quite a bit nowadays, but obviously the majority of comics fans are still Marvel, DC, Image, Dark Horse, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so even you can shout as loud as you want, <laughs> sometimes you're just not going to be heard. And so Kickstarter is great for getting your voice out there. Yeah, um, but yeah, it's exhausting. It's so much can go wrong with reward for f fulfillment. Um, printing costs you're not expecting um at least that's what i learned for nomad number one it was my first real full-fledged kickstarter and i thought i was prepared but i definitely was not um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I i thought i had it all planned out um i didn't format the comic correctly there's printing issues so i ended up spending probably 50 percent more on printing than oh. i should have Oh, that's just shipping was more than I expected. Um, so yeah, I'd say the beginning and after it's over was very exhausting. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. And me is just the, you know, the hustle and some of the guys do it really, really well and they're machines at it. Um, yeah. and they just, I don't think they sleep and I have to, um, I know, I, I don't know how they do it. I mean, I do a lot for Spinwiz. And I and these guys make me look like I don't do anything, and I'm constantly <laughs> no, right? posting. I'm like, holy crap! So let's let's go into Nomad since we're on the Kickstarter kick. Yep. Let's talk about Nomad in general. So we know that number one is up on Spinwiz. I'm going to drop a link in the chat right now in case people want to read it. Um, it's free to read right now. You know, Bill has been gracious enough to throw it in there just because he wants people to read his awesome work. Uh, I would highly suggest you read it. It's fantastic. Uh, Thank you. Number two, I, I haven't read it yet, obviously, because I don't have it. But I can only Nobody's read it yet. Oh, all right. Well, <laughs> Except for me. All right. And your wife. And my wife. And obviously, if it got to this point, she must. And like Stan and Robert have read it. But... Right. Um. So tell us a little bit about Nomad in general, and then you know, kind of work us through one without spoilers, and then two with like your little pitch. That way, people might want to tickle their fancy. Okay, uh, yeah. So basically, the easiest way that I've found to pitch it, um, to picture it in your head, is sort of uh, it's set in a world similar to Mad Max um, with sons of anarchy thrown in uh the nomads part of a biker gang 
Um, they kind of roam the wastes and just kind of survive killing monsters, robbing other clans. Um, they're not really good people, but they're not necessarily bad people either because they're just in a horrible situation. They're surviving. Yeah, they're surviving. Um, so I guess you could say there's a little bit of Walking Dead in there. It is a little inspired by The Walking Dead because initially when I started writing it, I kind of pictured it um, sort of open-ended. Um, but yeah, so the first issue, we're introduced to the Vulture gang. And the Nomad is their resident monster hunter. And he brings in the big bucks by hunting monsters and uh, trading it for goods and things like that. Um, the rest of the gang is recklessly attacking a train shipment um, that's owned by what we call a melder in the Nomad universe. They're basically a man mixed with a monster, um, so they have supernatural powers. Um, and that goes horribly wrong. That's not <laughs> <laughs> that's not a major spoiler that happens in the first like five or six pages. Yep, it does. Um, I didn't want to say it. I've read it, and I didn't want to say it because yeah. I didn't want to throw it off just in case. But since you did, that's yeah. fine. <laughs> yeah, so they attempt this major heist, um, and they're trying to get rich quick so they can move out of the area they're in um, because it's just a massive, super hot desert, and they hate it. Um, so that goes horribly wrong. And the rest of issue one is kind of setting up the repercussions of that heist. Um, issue one and ends on a pretty big cliffhanger, um, without saying too much, they basically get their asses kicked. Mm -hmm. They sure <laughs> um, do. So then issue two opens up right after that scene. And we get to see what happens to Nomad and the rest of the gang when they mess with someone that's way more powerful than them. Um, we introduce a few new characters that are melders as well, mm -hmm. but um, they're on Nomad's team this time. So Nomad's going to start trying to fight back. Um, so yeah, that's where issue two starts off. I can't really say too much more because i'm just gonna start giving away the whole yeah, story don't, yeah don't do that we want, we, want people, <laughs> we want people to buy it we want people to yeah. kick it so yes um i think what i liked about the comic is the writing is great i think what a lot of writers in my opinion do wrong is they are too wordy yeah and i think you let the imagery do a lot of the talking for you and i had to learn that um, cause I was too wordy. My first, uh, I think I went through three or four edits of Chimera before the artist is finally like, okay, now I'll work on this. Because yeah. <laughs> it was just we're like, I want to get it out. I wanted to, I want it, the feeling to be there. And, and a good artist like you have will a lot, will draw it to show that emotion and what's going on. Cause the character at the very end that is uber powerful, that just wipes the floor with them yeah. is awesome. Like you can almost see the power emanating from him yeah and, and that's all stan he's really insane mm -hmm. he's he he basically turned the world of the nomad into what it is um i basically came to him with the idea and he's like this sounds cool and just started <laughs> It's <laughs> it's going to sound negative at first, but he basically took my script and just completely changed all of the scenes that I had written. Oh, jeez. Um, yeah. <laughs> but he, what he ended up doing was kind of getting my mind going and setting the stage for the rest of what the world could be. Mm -hmm. um, because I... I'll admit now, looking back, my original idea was kind of generic. Um, it definitely wasn't as off the wall insane as what Stan ended up drawing. Mm -hmm. um, the basic idea was the same, the train heist, all that. But he just started drawing all these freaks and all these crazy designs. Um, and it just made my 
creativity go wild. And to this day, he's still, we go back and forth on it. Now we kind of bicker me, him and Robert, we kind of bicker about <laughs> what should and what shouldn't be in there and how far we should or shouldn't go. Um, but yeah, he, we owe a lot of the creativity to Stan because he really set it off. Well, I think that this is, and I wasn't just kind of blowing smoke when I said earlier, this is one of the best looking comics we have on Spinwiz Comics as a partner. Um, yeah, thank and you. I, and I think that is because it is, obviously Stan is awesome. Colors are great. Writing is good. But when you and I were talking actually off uh, off screen, and part of it is getting through this vapor of so many pieces of content from a ton of people because they're not now there's tons of people trying to create content and getting it out there um yeah and that's what obviously what our platform does it kind of cuts through some of that and and highlights it so people can see it and and access it easier but in the great scheme of things like your comic could literally be right next to marvel without a problem i mean it's it's that good and what I think people need to know when they're listening to the podcast or if they're online right now or they're looking on YouTube, go to that link and just read it. Even if you don't read it and you just want to look at it and see what Stan and Robert did. Yeah. It, it's, it's really well done. The scene transitioning is fantastic. Um, your eye moves the way it's supposed to. And then I would almost go through, look at it, see if you can see what's going on because you can um, cause that's what I usually do. I will actually go through the comic, flip through it, see if I can get the story. And then I go back and read it to see if it was right. And with yours, it really does feel like you're reading it as you're looking at it. And that's a huge bonus to anybody that is reading, com at least for me, um, being a movie buff and a gaming buff, um, you know, you kind of see things in that certain format cause that's how the storytelling is. And it feels right. like it could easily fall into a movie script. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like I said, I owe a lot of that to Stan and Robert. Um, they're just the dynamic duo. <laughs> they've mm -hmm. been working together for quite some time and they've both really honed their craft. Even from the time when we first started spitballing on Nomad, um, the art's gotten better. Um, but yeah, I, I'm glad you said that, um, it's cinematic in feel because that's what I try to go for with my scripting. Um, when I picture the scene transitions, I want it. I, I do picture it fading to black, you know, like a TV show mm -hmm. or a movie. Um, because that's what I love about the comics that I love to read. Um, it is, it's like a, <laughs> it's hard to explain without saying it's basically a movie on a page. No, it's, um, I completely get it. Yeah. So that's what I try to explain to people who don't know anything about comics or um, graphic novels. I just say it's basically like reading a movie. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I try to go for. And I'm glad that you think that. Yeah, I have um, one thing we're going to do with SpinWiz in the near future as soon as I can get a couple more things set up. Now that we have our YouTube channel set, finally, one thing we're going to start doing is um, I'm going to bring people in from the community or special guests, and we're actually going to do voiceover for the comic. Oh, nice. And we're just going to really go cool. page by page, just super fun. Um, the first time is going to be a first read through. So nobody really knows what's going on. Obviously I do. Cause I've already read most of the comics and that's a right. lot of comics, but yeah, I bet. Um, I know what's going on and obviously you would be there just as a director slash whatever, just to have fun. And it's meant to be fun. It's not meant to be serious. So first, first time is that. And then second time is the, the what we would co consider the actual run through. And then third time, people from the community actually get to um, make bets or dibs or, you know, donations to change it, um, like our voices. Like one guy will say, I want you to read your character like the Swedish chef from the Muppets. <laughs> and what I hope to get out of that is the fact to show people that you guys work super, super, super hard on this content. 
and I want more people to read it and see it and love it because I only bring people on that I think have great content and are great people and have the same vibe. And I think people have to remind it, be reminded or be introduced to comics and the fact that they are fun. Um, right. Some of them are super dark and gritty and nasty, but even those are fun. Yep. <laughs> um, and like yours, yours is, I wouldn't say ultra violent, but pretty damn violent. It's, yeah. It's, it's borderline ultra violent. Uh, so a, I, couple, a couple of the scenes were pretty graphic and I was super appreciative of it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but like I said, we kind of have to rain stand in sometimes. And that was us raining stand in mm -hmm. <laughs> with the violence. If, if I ever so. hire stand for Chimera, I am going to have a Chimera number two, and then I'm going to have a Chimera number 2.1. Yep. And two will be what it should be, and then two point one is just letting Stan off the hook. And <laughs> be just, careful what you wish for. I know, and it's probably going to be another ten pages of just blood splatter and <laughs> yes, you know, and it absolutely decapitated yeah. corpses. And I'm like, Stan, there's nobody gets decapitated, and he's like, there is now, you know, exactly stuff That's like that. That's pretty much how it goes. Yeah, so um, <laughs> that'd be awesome, though. <laughs> That'd be hilarious. I have I actually have not met Stan yet. I mean, we have Source Point is a, is a partner of ours as well, and yep. I have actually not met him or Robert yet. Yeah, they're great guys. Um, I met Stan. Well, I guess three years ago now, when we first started talking about Nomad, and then he introduced me to Robert and, um. Me and Robert have become really good friends. He actually was at my wedding last year. Oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah. So um, you can really make a lot of good friends through comics. I was really surprised. Yeah. Too. And Stan probably would have been at my wedding, but he's from Russia, and uh, that gets pricey. <laughs> uh, yeah, for sure. Probably more than the comic would cost. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for sure. Um, you know, let's, let's hit on that a little bit. Not to move away from Nomad, but you bring up a really good point that while there are so many indie content providers um, that are trying to get that, get out there and make it, you go to a couple of shows or you start talking to people and you do become friends with a lot of these guys because they're very much in the same spot. Um, just right. like me. I mean, you and I hit it off very easily. Um, and But I can talk to anybody from any of the publishers that we have on the site everybody it, it's odd how much cookie cutter it is that we all work full-time jobs yeah most of us have spouses that are just like hey i got you like it's your thing you love it keep going um and then we do this not for the money but because we want people to either hear our stories or see our art and um not buy it obviously so we can make something but it's right. more about sharing that story that we have in our head or sharing the art behind a story that they feel is awesome. Do you feel the same way? Yeah, I a hundred percent relate to that. Um, honestly, I mean, it's obviously the dream to make it a career. Um, but that's not really the first goal right now is just to get out there. Um, Kickstarter, I'm not really going to make any money off the Kickstarter. Um, what I do make will go into the Nomad number three, hopefully. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and yeah, I've, I've only done, I've only tabled at one show myself. Um, but I did happen to run into a couple guys that I knew from Facebook. Um, Jack Holder. He's a really nice guy. I ran into him. He does a couple books. He just uh, did an Indiegogo for Why Faith, a oh, comics anthology. I, know I don't that. know if you've heard of that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, he was super nice, and we both just said basically what you just said. Um, our significant others are very supportive, um, and I think if my wife wasn't as supportive as she is, I probably would have given up on this a long time ago. Um, she's always in my corner, um, telling me to keep going. Um, because being a creative can be hard, you know, mm -hmm. just writing and writing and writing and not gaining any traction. And it's like, 
yeah, I like doing this, but why am I doing this if nobody's going to read it? <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but yeah, um, I've made friends with guys who are doing Kickstarters at the same time as me. Um, like Mike Tenner, he did a yep. Kickstarter for, um, he did one for Midnight Highway recently. Um, he did one. We met. He was doing his Kickstarter for Black Jackets. Oh, such a good one. title too. Yeah, that's a really good book. Um, uh, I'm trying to get him on Spinwiz just so I can share with the world Black Jackets. Yeah, <laughs> it's really good. Francesco Tomaselli, I believe, is the artist. Um, I think it's like a really right. cool. It's black and white, but it's not regular black and white <laughs> you've read it so you know what i'm talking about oh, it's, it's like a awesome. stylized black and white yeah i think i probably have it right here actually i do it's right there that's that's black yeah. jackets um mike owes me big for bringing it up on this yeah <laughs> um and just to, especially during your interview you can you ping him later and be like dude way to way to hijack my yeah. um I know, my thing. Right? But that's what it looks like. That's that that black that you're talking about. It, it's um, it's the odd use of negative space to create right. definition, and it's right. not really anything I've ever seen. And it's awesome. Yeah, it's it's really good. It's one of my favorite um, indie titles currently. Um, I think I have Nomad down here too. That would be cool. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I want to take a minute to, you know, to go down here and I'm not on screen, but uh, I kind of want to see if I, I have four piles of indie comics. <laughs> so I just yeah, don't I know, bet. like I've got a bunch in here. I've got some down here and these are like the ones I'm going to reread again or I want to bring up. And I got a whole bunch from old ones that are signed in here. I have a whole nother set upstairs. My wife's probably like, what the hell are you doing with all these? And I'm like, <laughs> well, I, I help, I kickstart. Like, that's what I do. So right. um, you got to hold on to all of them. I can't just get rid of them. Exactly. I'm going to bring them to a show and get a picture with you when the next show we're going to. Um, nice. That's dope. So a- as we talk about that, le- let's go back to Nomad real quick. And you said it was kind of open-ended. Have you changed that? Are, are you thinking now that it will have the, like, you'll stop on one main arc after X amount? Or is it the story just kind of developing as it goes? Um, right now... I do have an ending in mind. Um, like it's a really collaborative effort. Um, me, Robert, and Stan basically spitball things, and um, we all came up with ideas. And I kind of made a plan for a few story arcs out of that. Mm-hmm. Um, so right now, yes, we have an ending in mind, but honestly, that could change tomorrow. Um, that's just kind of how I work creatively. I always try to keep it loose because I feel like if I just me personally, I know some guys plot everything to a T like me. Um, yep. (laughs) And they, I have introduced more of that into my writing. I used to just be a complete pantser and just not plot anything but especially with comics i've realized that's not a great idea because it's so (laughs) it's so episodic you know yes um so i have started plotting um but those plots i'm open for them to change um but yeah so short answer we do have an ending in mind but it could be open-ended so (laughs) I guess there isn't really a definitive answer. Yeah, I was wondering because I what I do when I write is I um, Chimera is a twenty issue series. Yep. And I outlined the whole thing, but I left pockets on what actually happens as I start to write. Because, and again, maybe you're like this too. You'll start writing, and you'll be like, it's almost like you jump into that person's skin as to how they're going to react. Yep. And you might write it and you'll write the whole thing. You'll go through like four or five pages and, until it's like a mini arc. And then you'll go back and be like, but that sucks. And like you <laughs> have to rewrite it or or it goes off in a different way where you're like, well, I wasn't planning with that. 
but it's really cool how that started to go and you really jive it and then you, you finish another 10 pages right and all of a sudden issue three is done and you're like right ah oh, damn like it's right. cool the story's going great but it's not even close now i gotta try to hook it back into where my 20 is and get it back online do you find you're doing the same thing yeah um part of me wishes that i could just sit down and plot every single issue um and leave it alone and i've tried to do that and i think it's physically impossible for me to not edit things while i'm writing um mm -hmm. me too <laughs> so there is even there's even some parts of nomad number one that i would change if i could Ooh, um, really yeah just minor just minor things you know um just little pieces of lore that i have going in my head just like because i'm a nerd for world building and things like that mm -hmm. and i i tell myself everything has to have a reason for why it's happening and how it happened um sometimes that's good and other times it's just incessant and <laughs> i'm too anal about it um so you know at some point you just kind of gotta let it be it's it's you know it's out in the world it is what it is even though i see so many errors with it nobody else has seemed to see the other <laughs> the yeah, errors that will. i yeah exactly um so you just gotta keep going um but yeah i think everybody any creative person sees things wrong with their project that nobody else would ever see. Yeah. Um, and it's just the nature of really the human mind creating something is just, it's constantly changing. Yes. You know, you can For see, sure. I can read my book the same exact words on the pages 50 times and maybe see, Oh, this should have gone this way. This should have gone that way. And, and just, you know, drive myself crazy. <laughs> and and <laughs> but, you will. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've already reread it several times and said, Oh, I shouldn't have said that. I should have said this. And, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you sit there trying to think of badass lines for the villain to say. And you're just like, Finally, you're just like, screw it and just write something. And yeah. then you send it off to the printer and then you read it and you're like, oh, I really should have gone with number five, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's it's like the Seinfeld episode where George Costanza couldn't think of some, a comeback. Yeah. And then near the end, <laughs> yeah. he finally got it, you know? Yeah. And it, that's the way I feel too. I, I went back through Chimera and I'm like, a couple of the things I was like, ooh, like could have done without that. And it just, again, it's maturity. It's becoming a better writer. It's yep. learning that each page costs you three hundred and ninety-seven dollars. Yep. And, <laughs> and you want to be as succinct as possible, yet not so short that there's not a feeling of a true story or or a, a, a full issue. Um, I was actually trying to get your issue up on the stream so I could show some people some of the art, and for whatever reason. OBS does not want to show any of your content. So um, that's I'm, all right. I, well, I dropped the links in. The links are below. So if, again, if you're on YouTube and you're checking it out, the links are below. Go check it out. You can you can read issue one for free. The Kickstarter is there as well. Um, if you're on uh, listening on the podcast, obviously just read the transcription and it'll, the link will be right there. You can click over to it. So um, I am I going back to that. I'm much the same way. I call it um, looking in the mirror syndrome. Because yep. when you look at the mirror, um, like me, I'm like, my, I feel like my head is weird, like misshapen. <laughs> and like, I'll say that and people are like, what the hell are you talking about? And I'm like, well, yeah. there's, there's this one little bump and they're like, what? And, but if you ask anybody, there's always something they don't like about themselves that nobody else a notices or B even cares about. Um, and that's the way I feel when I write. And it sounds like you do the same way where you, you write it and then you, you print it, you go back through it and you're like, man, I wish I would have changed that one little thing. And yep. everybody else is like, big deal. 
Like, and I'm sure it yep. happens to Stephen King. It probably happened to George Lucas, um, except for the first three movies. I think he, <laughs> oh, mm. and I mean, I don't mean the original. I mean episodes yeah. one, two, and three. Yeah, um, I, I knew. What you meant. <laughs> except for Darth Maul, he's fantastic. But other, other than that's a whole that's a whole nother podcast. That's a whole that nother is, discussion of Star is, Wars. Yeah. Um, we might have a Star Wars roundtable after Episode Nine comes out, which you are more than welcome to jump in on with us. Absolutely, it'll be like I could four... talk for hours about Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> my wife, who's normally in my corner, um, I'll start talking about Star Wars, and she'll just be like, she'll just look at me and be like, <laughs> and just shake her head and just go back to whatever she's doing. <laughs> you know, my buddies and I will start talking about it. Um, and I, I want to tell you a quick story because you, I want to see what your face is when this happens. Um, okay. We were, this is maybe three, four months ago. Um, maybe a little bit longer than that, but it was a while ago. And my son just turned seven. So this was when he was probably closer to being six or has, was just six years old, right around there. And he was, we were going to watch Star Wars together. Um, we had already watched episode four. And so yep. I wasn't doing the machete method. I was actually taking him the way that we had seen it. Um, right. And I'm, you know, we're talking and we're doing something in the kitchen and him and I are talking and, um, and she's like, well, you know, it's, it's going to blow his mind when he finds out Darth Vader's his father and Hud my son Hudson is standing four feet away oh, no. <laughs> and my jaw just drops and I, I have, it, it is very difficult for me to be upset with my wife, um, because she's a, a wonderful woman and she's so supportive, but this is one right. of those times where I was like, I am drastically frustrated with you right now <laughs> and on something that really does not matter. And in, in the great scheme of things that does not matter, if, but um, it matters to you though. It did. And Hudson, right. my, my son, thank God he really didn't hear it. Like you could tell that something clicked in his head, but he didn't hear it. And cause I asked him a couple questions about Darth Vader later and it looked like he didn't understand what my wife said. And I was like, dodged a huge bullet there. Um, but I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> and she's like, what, what's the big deal? And I'm like, no. And that's my story. That's all I got. I mean, that's, yeah. that's my funniest <laughs> star Wars story that I have. That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's so funny how passionate we get about things like <laughs> the stories that mean so much to us. Mm hmm. And it, in the moments like that, it just feels so real, you know. <laughs> it does. It does. It, it, it really felt like um, she had just put a thermal detonator in my hand and walked away. Yeah. <laughs> and it was just like, bye. <laughs> Kick you right in the Sarlacc pit. <laughs> exactly. It, exactly. I know how Boba Fett felt getting just destroyed by the Sarlacc pit and coughing up my armor. Like, oh, <laughs> To this day, I'm still, it still, it still turns my stomach. <laughs> anyway, we, yes, I will invite you to the round table after episode nine. Cause after, um, you know, my buddy and I, we always go opening night. It's, it's a given. Um, yeah. So we, we'll, and my high school buddy always see the new ones together as well. Mm -hmm. Have to, I mean, cause, and now it was, you know, back a decade ago it was less it was more about the event and going and now it's because i don't want anybody to spoil it for me because people Ugh, are I know. such d-bags i know <laughs> on on the internet um i think they should get arrested for such stupidity to be honest with you um, i agree at least a fine you know yes yeah you are Pops up in facebook messenger you're fined 50 dollars for spoiling yes and the rise we, of Skywalker. <laughs> yeah, Google and Google and Amazon are listening to us anyway. Can't, can't oh yeah, they, they listen to everything we say. All right? Can't so they that, put a code in there that's like "Holy shit, spoiler!" and something pops right. out like from Demolition Man, and uh, yeah. you know it just kind of comes out of the side of the wall or out the Alexa. You're fine, two hundred fifty five fifty dollars for being a douche, like right. just <laughs> something like that. But I don't know. You know the dreams, dreams, really. I know, um, especially with the. I'm sure your friends list as is mine is just filled with comic fans and nerds. And it's, you know, most people are considerate, but there's always one or two people that just can't help themselves. Mm -hmm. They have to let it be known that they're the first they've seen it. You all haven't seen it. 
I'm going to brag about it and just spoil it. Yep. And each one and of those people needs a grundle punch. It's just That's right. <laughs> just and, I, and I'm not a violent person, but there are certain things like that that are deserving of a grundle, just a knuckle right to the grundle. And I, they, I they need to understand how pissed off you really are. That's right. Oh, finally. See, I, I knew. It's I, like, you know, I, I, know, we were I always like tell that. my wife, she she understands that I'm passionate about these things. Um, but she doesn't always quite get the rage <laughs> of <laughs> being spoiled. Yes. And I'm like, you know, I don't look forward to much. Like, mm-hmm. I enjoy sports, but like these Marvel movies, you know, this is like our Super Bowl episode nine coming out. Mm-hmm. This is like our Super Bowl. And it's like as if if you're a sports fan and you look forward to the Super Bowl all year, you look forward to the party, you know, someone happened to know who was going to win the game and they just blast it all over Facebook. Mm-hmm. That's what it feels like. It really does. It, I I could not have said it better myself. Um, and and they leaked all of the commercials too, just to just That's to right. be a secondary jackass. Like no, right? You could some time traveler just yeah. came back and posted on Facebook the exact score and all the commercials. What an ass. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you what, and that would... would piss me off because I am a super, I am a football fan as well. So yeah, who do you cheer for? Uh, the Patriots. I know that's not very popular. Bill. You, you, I know. You, you I'm ha- in Maine. So. <laughs> I mean, you're kind of allowed. I mean, the the guy that I go watch all my Star Wars stuff with and all the nerdy stuff, he is also a Patriots fan. Yeah. So much so that he has the tattoos down his arm. Oh, jeez. Like, I'm not that hardcore. He, he's but... hardcore, and he's from um, the Cape Cod area. So it's I, I can't it's basically a religion around there. So it is, it yeah. is. You you have lobster and patriots. Yeah. Um, and, and so I get it. I mean, I bust his chops constantly. Um, but my my Carolina Panthers are doing. I mean, they won last week somehow against the Jags, <laughs> but I know. I, I'm not even going to get into it. My other team was the New York Giants, and they finally benched Eli Manning. Um, Daniel Jones. Yep. You never know. He's looking pretty good. He is. He he's doing great. Um, and I like fantasy football. Also, it's the first time I played in like five years, and that's Same. fun too. You know, yeah, that's just super tons of fun. So, um, anyway, again, we could talk about that all night as well. Um, yep. It is nearing the ten o'clock hour. Um, we have been on for almost forty five minutes of of discussion. We could nerd out like crazy. Uh. Random question, tabletop gaming as well or no? No, but I've always um, wanted to try it. Um, I've just honestly never had anyone around me that wants to play, <laughs> <All right. laughs> to be honest. We might do something online in the near future. I'll bring you in. We'll teach. We'll, we'll learn you up. Yeah, that'd be really fun. It'll be great. Yeah, I I, could I've always wanted to, to try it, but oh, it's, I'm definitely it's... not opposed to it. It's a blast. I need to find somebody who can um, GM better than I can. So the odd part is, even though I am a decent writer, I think I'm a decent writer. I've been told I'm a, I'm a good writer. I think at the very top, I'm a decent that I got lucky. Is that what the yeah. way I say it? Um, <laughs> I'm not good at telling stories in a um, dungeon master setting. Like I can't right. make stuff up on the fly. Like some some people are just so good. Like comedians can just rip through it and and work with the room. I can't. Um, I'm more of a planner in how I want things to go, and I think about them. So as soon as I find a GM and I find a game we want to play, we'll probably actually have another night that is not interview based. It's going to be D and D or something like D and D, D and D S, and we'll get you in there, even if it's just a guest spot for one week. We'll get you. Yeah, we'll, we'll learn. Yeah, that'd up. be fun. Roll, roll a couple D twenties and see what you do from the yeah. role playing aspect. <laughs> you just have to be patient with me, probably. Hey, patience is what I have. I mean, I have to, right? Um, anyway, uh, we're pretty much done. Is there anything else you want to talk about before we take off? No, I think we pretty much said it all. Yeah. Um, um I, I mean, we can riff on random topics all night. I'm sure, 
but <laughs> I think that'll be part two when I have you back on again. If you would like to come back on again, you are more than welcome. Uh, yeah, we can, absolutely. I've we, had fun. We can riff on nerdum all night long. Nerd. Oh nerd, yeah. Nerd. Nerdum or is it any n e r d d o m or n e r d o m? <laughs> I think it's n e r d o m. Nerdum. Yeah, we'll Nerd go with dumb. we'll go with yeah, that. You're you're a better writer than I am. So um, I don't know about that. I'm we, just pulling it out of my ass. <laughs> well, that's okay. I mean, well, welcome to welcome to my life and 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 what I have to get through sometimes just to get through the day. Um, I, I appreciate you being here. Um, everybody, remember down below the links to not only Nomad Number One from Vulture Comics, um, written by this gentleman right here, Bill Stoddard, but also uh, the Kickstarter. How long is the Kickstarter running? How much longer is it? Um, I think you still have 21 days okay, off so the top of my head. This will be up on YouTube by this weekend. So everybody okay. watching on YouTube, by all means, you got some time, but get it before it's gone. Uh, make sure you, if you'd like to support Indie Comics, Bill is one of the people that you want to support because the content's fantastic. And hopefully the more money he makes, he can get Stan to drop whatever he's doing and make <laughs> more nomads quicker. Um but That'd be again, awesome. Thank you for being here, man. Let's stay in touch. Let me know if you need my help. Otherwise, uh, best of luck on the Kickstarter. Can't wait to see Nomad number two. And I hope you have a wonderful night. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's been a blast. Most I definitely. was pretty nervous coming into it, but we, we got I had you, a lot man. of fun. No nerves. Yeah. No nerves. You did perfect. <laughs> you're you're you know exactly what you're doing. 